okay, good, good, good. I asked, I said, I was like, oh, what are you doing? He was like, no, he was like, what are you home on the day? He was like, Monday? <laughs> no. Broncos was off. So they were off. Mine were off on that Friday and that Monday. And Friday is not bad for me because we're, we have, we don't have to, but we were given the option to work remote one day a week. And so I don't have classes on Friday. So that's usually my remote day. So I was like, well, that doesn't really bother me because I'm not going to drive down here anyway. So, <laughs> well, I'll just be at home and I'll see Friday. Um, <laughs> but so Friday worked fine. But Monday, I was like, I really don't want to drive all the way over here just to sit in a room and give a test. We were literally just sitting down. Y'all are the ones doing the work. Mm -hmm. I have to do the work now. <laughs> when I great. Um, so I'm working on them. They're in progress. They're in progress. I have, I think there were, I think there's eight online. So I graded those. And then I think I graded three. And I was just in the middle of my fourth one for the paper phase class. And then I'll get to the remote class after that. Um, but I will submit everything except for the face to face classes. Yours are, um, I have the paper, so I just hand them back to you when we get to class. But for the remote and for the online, I do um, or upload everything. So I actually printed it a little bit different this time. Those rubrics that were on the test, right? It said like the 12 point problems and then the 20 point problems. I printed out sheets of those little rubrics. So I literally have like for number one, it's rubric next to me and then a test next to me. And so then I'm checking off the rubric and then I'm just gonna put all of those sheets of paper at the back of the file. So when I get it all back to you, you're gonna have your papers and then you're gonna have all those rubrics so you can see how you were stored on each individual problem, okay? Um, but like I said, I was right in the middle. <laughs> and I think there's only, I think this is it right now we have been. So there's six of you in here. I've gotten through three and a half. <laughs> so I'm almost, you know, I'm getting there with this class, but then I still have the six folks that are in the remote class. But again, I hope to get it done, hopefully before the weekend, because I really would not want to break during the weekend, but if I have to, I will. Um, but it should be done before Monday. And then I'll do the same thing as I did with the first one, where I also give you like a little mini report, right? So it'll tell you like what your web assign average is of now, it'll tell you what your test average is of now, and then with the percentages that, that are in the syllabus, it'll kind of give you where your current grade is at right now, okay? Um, don't look in campus right now because, well, for you, y'all don't have a test grade. <laughs> it's just missing, right? And then for the remote students, I haven't added any points in there, so definitely don't look at Canvas to get <laughs> it's like just don't oh, right. Yeah, just wait. And then once I have it all off, then I'll put through my message to go ahead and look. <laughs> um, but right now it's a little crazy. Okay, this is my reminder to hit record, but I am recording. So I'll erase that. Um yes. I got a question about I don't know if you went over on the yeah, the formula C, the mm -hmm. formula for the X base that X was a line of Y and line and stuff. When you don't have the actual formulas at X and G of X, that formula will be on the sheet. What do you mean? The, uh, I don't think I have that with me. Oh, but I have that on my screen. Let me go grab it. Don't on our review sheet, it was there. Oh, he's got it in that extended one. That's why. Could be seeing what's on my screen. Hold on, what's going on with the mouse? Oh, it's because he has it extended. Let me fix my this thing. <laughs> oh, he always has it on. He has it to where it's like it's this, and then it's a whole yeah, other screen. But I just like to mirror what's on my screen because I can't look over there and figure out what's what. <laughs> okay, now it should match. So let's go to the review, or if I click on the test, it's the same formulas as what was printed. So which one? It's the second to last moment, moments in center of mass two dimensional system. Mm -hmm. This y. one's? Yeah, those two. These two? Yeah. I didn't see those on the on our formula sheet on the test. I, I forgot to help you find them. I couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. I have to go look at that. I didn't know about that. I have they're in my room though, so I have to go look at them. 
We had the last one. It was just that second to last one. I couldn't find it. This one? Yeah. And Y equals M. Hmm. I'll go check it out. I'll go check it out. Uh, yeah, because we didn't use that one. We did this one. But yes, let me, not right now, but after class, I'm going to look. And if I need to message you, I'll message you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, today, though, we're going to cover 8.1 and 8.2. And this one is, it's not anything really new going on here. It's all a bunch of old stuff. It's just kind of reminding us, I guess, of what we've been doing. And then one thing that we did not really see, so they get a little bit more complex on this 8.1 than what we saw in chapter five, just a tiny, tiny bit. And, and the only reason why I think the two of y'all actually that were confused on that one is because you forgot about completing the square. And somebody was saying, well, how did you factor that? And I actually didn't factor at all. <laughs> I was completing the square. Okay. And that is a topic that they teach you in intermediate algebra. And then I think you use it again in college algebra. So we should have seen that. I did put in a little snippet to a YouTube video if you need to review how to do that. Um, but you definitely do need to do completing the square. Whenever y'all study circles, I think in pre-cal, you'd also do completing the square. Um, because if I give you an equation that looks like this, um, is that supposed to be a seven? Like this, you need to know what the center and the radius are, right? And so you have to make this look like this in order to figure out what the center and the radius are, which means you've got to complete this square and you've got to complete that square in order to get them to look like this. Okay. So that was back when y'all were doing circles in pre cal It's like the very first thing that you do in pre cal um, Yeah. Yeah, because I didn't count one right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I did put a little video in there. We will cover one, sort of. Um, but you definitely need to get used to completing the square when there's a constant already there and then when there's not a constant there. Okay. You also need to get used to uh, completing the square when you have a coefficient in front of x squared and when you don't. So there's a difference between something like this, something like this, and then something like this versus something like this. It doesn't even need to be negative. Whatever it is. I'm going to put an odd number actually because it makes it more difficult. Uh, plus five. Okay. So you definitely need to know how to complete the square for all those. If you want extra work, try to complete the square on those and then text me your answers and I'll let you know if you're right. Okay. But you definitely need to know how to complete the square. If they give you a constant, if they don't give you a constant, if they do or they don't, but you have a coefficient in front of x squared. Because all four of those have different processes. They're not different processes. It's the same process. But they look different when you're working them out. Okay. Uh, we do have one. I think it's more of this kind that we'll cover today. Okay. But that is a prerequisite item. Okay. So you definitely should know how to do that. And it will be on you to review it. Okay. Um, but by all means, try it. Text me whatever you've got. And if it's going to ride, I'll let you know where it's going to ride, right? <laughs> so we can make sure that you understand it. Okay. But definitely try. Try to do those different four ones. And I think if you could do those four, you should be able to complete the square on everything. Okay. This one will have fractions, just FYI. Okay. Anytime this X is not even, you will have fractions. Okay. So that coefficient of X is not even. We'll have the fraction. So don't think you're wrong. Maybe you get fractions, but it, it, it's going to have fractions. Okay. I think in college algebra, not college algebra, it is college algebra. At the very, very, very beginning, when they show you how to solve quadratics, there are three different methods. There's the zero factor property, which means you factor it, right? And then you set each factor equal to zero, and you get your, your answers, right? I know y'all know that one because I've seen it on the test. Y'all were doing it. When y'all had to set the two functions equal to each other and solve, y'all move them over to one side, you factored them, and then you put each one equal to zero, right? So I know you know the zero factor property. The other one is the quadratic formula. 
and we haven't really used it too much because they've been pretty factorable, right? But that is always an option, right? Your quadratic formula. And then the other option that you learn in college algebra is what's called the square root property, okay? So if you had something like this, the square root property allows you to take the square root, but then you get plus or minus in your answer, right? So that will get rid of the house, and then this becomes a three, right? But in that same section, they told you to, in fact, this is not a good problem because that isn't the first square. <laughs> they can come up with something different, maybe 10. Um, <laughs> but the plus 90 was already perfect. Um, but if you were to solve something like this with completing the square or with the, the, the square root property, you do have to do the completing the square. So if you were asked to solve this using the square uh, the square root property, you would have to get it so that it's x plus something squared equal to something else. You have to make it like that. So you have to complete the square in order to get it to look like this. And then once it looks like this, then you can do your little square root on both sides and the plus or minus, right? Okay. So there were three strategies. That was like the main idea in polynomial. One of the main ideas. The other one was how to graph polynomials and rational functions and stuff like that, right? So graphing and solving quadratics is basically the big ideas in college algebra. That goes forever. Yeah. <laughs> but you've been using it throughout. You just don't realize you've been using it throughout. There are sections in every class following college algebra that uses completely square. We just don't we don't remember. <laughs> we have one. So you'll kind of see. You'll see how to do this one. And then hopefully you can, it'll jog back your memory to do these. Um, and I think in a video, I did one like this. What I haven't done is ones like these, and that could happen, okay? So definitely try them and see if you can get there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, x squared plus three. Which one? The, this one? The x squared plus six, x plus seven. It will be, no, not plus three. Um, no, I don't want to <laughs> say too much more, but no. It will be x. Then plus or minus something, most likely because that's a plus, it will be plus something squared, and then you'll have plus or minus something else. And then when you FOIL this and you combine that with it, it should give you that 10 constant. Okay. So that's what you're doing, is you're basically peeling it apart. You're, if I expand this and combine all my like terms, I should get that. Okay. And so, yeah. It, you want to know the answer? I'll tell you what the answer is, but you got to figure out how to get there. That's the answer. Okay, but you've got to figure out how. To, how do you get that? Okay, <laughs> and especially how do you get that for this one? This one's the weird one. Okay, it's all fractions, and I definitely that one I can look at and figure it out, right? But this one I know it, that my brain does not work in fractions, so there's no way I would be able to just guess this one. Okay. It would require a little bit more <laughs> elaborate explanation there. Okay. Um, but let's try. So we have one. And then I think there was another comment on the videos that said, like, how will I know when I'm going to have to complete the square, when I'm going to have to do all of that? And there's no, like, I mean, I will give you one, like, clue. Okay. And I've mentioned it in the videos, but you might not have noticed that it was a clue. Um, but if you were to try, to let u equal something, to do u sub, and then you take the derivative of that u, right? Whatever you said u was, and you took the derivative. If there's variables in that derivative that you just don't have in the expression you were asked to integrate, that's when you're gonna probably need to do some kind of technique, okay? You just cannot just go straight into u sub, okay? And so you'll have to mess around with it. Um, I did see this one on there and I didn't cover one it like exactly like this problem in the video. So I just wanted to kind of address it real quick, but I saw one in weather sign that says, find the correct antiderivative. And so I just wanted to make you guys aware that essentially what you're doing on this problem is you're just taking the integral of both sides with respect to X. So notice that I'm just writing everything the same, but I'm putting the integral and then the DX around each side, right? What happens here is that these pretty much cancel and you get the integral with respect to y. And I'll leave that one alone. And what's the integral with respect to y? Okay. Yeah.
think this is it's so baby and elementary. Should know it. <laughs> what is it? This is a fat color. I'm gonna use green because the blue is like super super light. This is a one. What's the integral of one with respect to y? Y exactly. Right. So you're basically trying to find what did you take the derivative of to get that, right? That's what antiderivative is. Okay. On this side, though, I can let you equal the denominator, right? That's the more complicated thing of the two, right? And normally, when you're letting you equal something, it's always something in your denominator or something inside of a trig function or something inside of an exponent, those kinds of things, right? Or something that raised to an exponent. That's usually what you let u equal. Now here, if I do find du, I get 2x dx. Now here, I don't have to do any manipulation because I have the variable x, don't I? Okay. So if you wanted, you could peel this fraction apart and just write it times x dx. And then you see that you have the extra x, you just don't have the two, right? So I'll divide by two so that I know what to replace x dx with. And we're gonna replace it with d over two. So my denominator becomes the u, and then the x dx becomes this du over two. You can factor out the one half, and then you end up with du over u. So then we get the ln of the absolute value of u. And since I don't have bounds, I do have the plus c. For number one? It might've been a different one. It should not have any squares. Nope. <laughs> now, here, do I need these bars? Yes. I do not. Do I have any squares? going to be a positive. Right. And if I add four to a positive, it will still be positive, right? So it's always going to be positive. So we do not need those bars. So then this is what they're asking you. Okay, just that part. So this part was just basically identifying you and then applying our use of, right? That's not nothing new. We did that in uh, chapter five, but it's just to kind of bring it back because what's going to happen on this test is you're going to have a bunch of different integrals to take and you're going to kind of have to have the experience so that you know where, what direction it's going to go in, okay? And so if you do try to create something and set it as u, make sure that when you take the derivative of it, you have those variables there, okay? If you do not have all the variables with the right exponents and everything, it will require you to manipulate it a little bit, okay? And some of these problems can be done in different ways as well, okay? So it's gonna make it real fun when I have to grade it because I might have one solution, but you might have done it a completely different way, but it was completely good, you know? And so what I, you see in the solutions might not <laughs> match what you had, but you would still get the points as long as you executed it correctly. Okay? There was no errors or anything weird going on. Okay, so this is this is a more of like a, a smaller one again, but just to give you an idea of like how things can be done in different ways, right? We even talked about this one when we were doing chapter, um, whatever, is that problem one? That's what I'm wondering. Oh, because of the one half, that's fine. Let's go back. Is it that's multiple choice? Yeah. Okay, yes, thank you. Remember your log properties? You have a log property that says if you have this, it's the same as log base b of x to the r. Remember that log property? Way back, right? I have a coefficient, don't I? So if you were to type this in there, it should accept it. 
but it looks like once you hit the answer key, it gave you other things. So it's not that it didn't want that, it's just that that's the version that they have in there. Okay. Yeah, it's like you're not like right. So if that's supposed to be the case, then that means this thing can be written as a one half exponent. Okay. And then what are one half exponents? Square root. Square root. Okay. So either one of these it will accept. But it looks like if you look at the answer key, they have this version picked up. Okay. And I, I know I mentioned it before. <laughs> but this was the fun part about calculus back when I was taking it because all the problems seem to be like that. I would do the problem and I would simplify it to what I thought was simplified. <laughs> and then I would go look in the back of the book and it'd have something completely different. And I'm like, what in the world? So not only did I have to fight the battle like to get the answer, then I had to fight the battle of, is my answer even the same as their answer or do I have something completely off? You know what I mean? So I couldn't just check to find out if I got the answer right. Even the checking was work. <laughs> So it was a little challenging in the, in in Cal to like for real it was crazy. Luckily now we have these like machines, right? <laughs> you just click enter and it'll tell you whether or not it's correct. And WebAssign is pretty good about accepting different forms of the correct answer. Um, however, it is a machine, right? And it, it, it's it's only going to be as good as it's programmed. And if whoever programmed it didn't put in there every possible algorithmically way to write the answer, then it may not accept every possible way to write the answer. Okay. So you just have to play around with it and go, oh, yeah, trust me. I know. <laughs> trust me. I know. I didn't even have a computer to tell me I was wrong. I had to go figure out if I was wrong or not. Because mine never matched the book. Never, 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 never. But then I would mess with it and I'm like, oh yeah, it is the same. Or I would mess with it and be like, oh, it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get lost and start all over. Or I'd go ask my teacher and be like, sir, this is the same thing as that because I can't figure it out. <laughs> um, okay. So good one, good one. Thank you. Okay. So for this one, it's it's not as crazy, it's not as complicated as some of the other ones that can be done in different ways. But I did see this one in web design, so I wanted to talk about it because it can be done in different ways, okay? And I kind of outlined what the two ways are. The first one is just to use expansion. Since it is a square, it's pretty easy to square something, right? It's not too difficult. Um, and then versus using use substitution. So you can do it either way. Both of them will give you the exact same answer. Now, the answers may look different, but that doesn't mean that they're wrong, okay? They are equivalent. They just look different. So for the first one, if I were to expand that, it would be x squared minus 10x plus 25. And I could even kick the x out just so that I can integrate each term individually, right? And then put plus c, because that's what you get when you don't have facts, right? You get your constant of integration. So here it would be x cubed over 3 minus 10x squared over 2 plus 25x. And then if I distribute the six back in, that would be two x cubed minus 30 x squared plus 150x plus c. Right, six quarters of the dollar 50, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. And then U sub is, is different. It looks different as you're working it out, right? But it should be equivalent to what this has here, okay? So that's what I mean by your answers might look different depending on what method you use, but they're the same. So if I were to say let U equal what is being raised to a power, well, then DU would just be DX, right? It'd be like one DX, okay? So if I apply the U substitution, you get six, then the base is u with the square, and then the dx becomes du. Then if I integrate that, I just get u cubed over 3 plus c, which is 2u cubed plus c. And if I put the cube in there, 
what was u? u was x minus five, wasn't it? So you see how that looks different, right? And you're probably wondering how in the world is that the same as this other thing, okay? What? I, I was saying I'm not writing that out three times. Right, no, I don't. I used Pascal's triangle, but yeah. But they are equivalent, okay? And so if you were to type either one of these, the web assign, I hope that it accepts both, it should, okay? But if you were working this on the test, both of these, I would know, following your work, they're both valid, okay? So whichever one you try to choose to do, go for it, okay? If that were any other exponent besides two, I would be doing it this way. But I would stop there. I wouldn't expand it, okay? The only reason why I'm gonna expand this is just to prove to you that it's the same answer as this one, okay? That's the only reason I'm going further with this. Otherwise, these are it. Those are my answers, okay? But let's go ahead and do this. So I'm gonna use Pascal's triangle. So I get this guy cubed, which is x cubed. Then I get this guy squared, and then this guy. But with the three in the front, so the Pascal's triangle. And then the three in the front, this guy original, and this guy squared. And then finally, no more x's, just the negative y. And then I'm going to squeeze in my plus c. <laughs> so let's see what we get when we multiply this up. This becomes x cubed. This becomes negative 15x squared. This becomes 25, so that becomes 75x. And then this becomes negative 125 plus c. If I distribute my 2, Are those the same? Yeah, two fifty plus c. Yeah, one fifty plus c. Yes. I have one fifty x plus c. I also have one fifty x. Isn't this a constant? Yeah. Yeah. And isn't that a constant? They are the same. Nobody told you what c was, right? So apparently, this c. It's 250 more than that C, right? But it doesn't matter. They're both constants. And when I take the derivative of both of those, they're all going to go zero, aren't they? Okay. So they're the same. Okay. This is just another C, a different C. So that's why I'm saying there, there's, there's, and <laughs> when we get to three, it's going to be real fun. <laughs> Because trig, <laughs> you know, with all them identities, right? Everything always looks different. So someone could go in one direction, another person could go in another direction, and they might still both end up with seeing the correct answers. But they might look completely different. But if you were to play around with them some more, they actually are the same. Okay. Um, so it just depends on what where you go. Okay, but we're gonna learn lots and lots and lots of strategies. Uh, we're definitely gonna need those note sheets because there are so many strategies in chapter eight that. You have to have reference <laughs> when you're learning. I remember them, but that's just me. I've been teaching the class, basically taking the class, right, numerous times. So, <laughs> so yeah, I remember them. But if you're seeing it for the first time, you're going to be just how I was the first time. And not, you, you can't. You need reference. You need to be able to just something to bring back your memory. Okay. And so I put a little note on this one because of the question that uh, somebody had. I think it was Ben. Ben's not here. Um, hopefully he'll watch the recordings. Um, but the question was like, how do I know I'm going to need a complete square? Okay, and really, to be honest, there's one clue, but that's it. That's the only thing you have to go on. And essentially, even that clue is essentially just try. And if you can't do anything, you do something else. Okay. So, so in this one, if I were to try to let u equal what's inside that radical, I would have this, right? But when I do du, I would have 20 minus 2x, and then with this dx. And there's a problem, because I have an extra variable, right, that I don't have in my integral, okay? And that is the clue that you know you got to do something else, okay? And normally, we try to complete the square, because if we can complete the square, you end up with something you end up with x plus or minus something in here and then a number out there. 
Well, if I let if that equal you, what's du? If I were to let u equal whatever's in there, what would du be? What's the derivative of x? Just one. And what's the derivative of the constant? Zero. And then you have the dx, right? And that is not a problem. Don't I have that? I have dx, don't I? So the u sub wouldn't be an issue if I could get it to look like this, okay? So if I could get it to look like that, then I don't need this extra variable like it looks like I need up here, okay? And, and it truly does come with experience. The more and more and more intervals you try and the more and more problems you, you go at, the more you start to recognize situations of where you need to have the completing the square and where you don't, okay? This one, unfortunately, does require me to do completing the square. So we have one where we get to practice. Yay, we're actually not practicing that one. We're practicing this one, which is good because it's the harder. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to try to complete the square. So I'm going to just do this over here on the side. Completing the square. So the first thing you want to do is you want to take the expression you have and you need to put it in descending order. It is not in descending order right now, right? My x squared is in the back instead of in the front. So I'm going to write it like this. Are those equivalent? Right, same signs, they're just written in the reverse order, okay? Next is, this step you can skip on these two problems, okay? So you can skip steps, there's a bunch of steps, and this one, you can skip the second step. But for the bottom two, you cannot skip the second step because they have coefficients, okay? This doesn't look like it has a coefficient because you don't see a number, but there is a number there, right? It's negative one. And if it's not positive one, you need to consider it as a coefficient, okay? So if the coefficient is not positive one, what you have to do is you have to factor that coefficient out, okay? So let me write some rules over here on the side so that we can kind of have a reference sheet. And I'll put a little snippet in the, the note sheets. Right when we get the note sheets for the review and the test, I'll put a little snippet of the process for completing the square in case anybody needs to reference it. So if you have this, and it could have a plus C or it could not, it just depends on the problem. It really doesn't matter whether it does or doesn't, you still work it the same way. Okay. What you have to do is you have to factor out that A if it's not just a one. Okay. And then what you have is X squared and then B over A and then the X and you keep this other guy away. And if there's no number, you still have this. You just don't have a constant over here, right? So I'm gonna factor this negative one out. And when I do, the X squared will become positive and the 20 X will turn negative. And I don't have a little extra number up here, that's okay. Then the next thing you do is the actual completing the square part. Okay, and so what you're going to do is you're going to add and subtract. So it's like you did nothing at all, right? So if I add a number and subtract it, did I do anything? You didn't change the value, right? Because you put something in there, but you also took it out. So it's unchanged, okay? This thing. Now you have to be careful because when we say B, okay, we mean whatever is in front of x. So I don't even like using the letter b. I'm just going to say coefficient of x. So you have to take whatever that coefficient of x is and divide it by 2 and square it. The only time it would be b is if I didn't have to factor out the a, then this thing would have never changed, right? It would have just been like that, and then I could have added the b over 2 squared, okay? But because I had to factor it out, my b isn't b anymore, right? It's b over a, okay? In this case, my b over a is actually negative 20, right? If I were to take negative 20 and divide it by negative 1, don't I get the original positive 20, okay? So this is my b over a. And so what I have to do is I have to figure out what is negative 20 over 2 squared? 
for my problem, it's going to be negative 10 squared, which is 100. So that's the number that I'm going to have to add and subtract, okay? And if I add it inside the parentheses, I also need to subtract it inside the parentheses, okay? So when I come over here, I'm going to say minus 20x, and then I'm going to have to add the 100, and I'm going to have to subtract the 100. Now, it's hard to do this with the symbols, but essentially what you would do is you would have you would have plus, um, just in this case, it's B over A over two, and then minus B over A squared, okay, plus your C. I'm not doing this one anymore. That was just there. We're kind of actually doing it live. The problem is, is that in order for you to complete the square, um, Um, in order for us to complete the square, we only need three terms, right? Whenever you complete the square, whenever you square something and you foil it all out, right? You combine your like terms. Don't you always end up with something like this, right? Where you have, oh, you can't see. You yeah. have three terms. You have whatever your x squareds are, whatever your x coefficients are, and then your constants, right? After you combine like terms. So we only need those three terms in there. We don't need this extra one that's out here. Okay, so what you're going to have to do to kick it out is you're going to have to distribute this number to that number to kick it out of the parentheses. And so then you get negative one times negative 100. Now this part you can factor. And then this actually multiplies to give you a positive 100, right? So what times what will give me this trinomial? X times X will give me X squared. But what numbers multiply to give me positive 100, but add to give me negative 20? 10, positive or negative? Negative. Okay. And when they're the same, don't we just write them as 10, X minus 10 squared, right? And then if I want, I can rewrite them the way they were before, right? Where they had the positive guy in the front. And have that there instead. Okay. So this is not what's going to be in the review. It's like words that tells you what to do. <laughs> but I just kind of wanted you to see it does work for whenever there's a number in front. And it even works when there's not a number in front. It's just not as complicated when there's no number that you took out because then you don't have to do this distributing business. You just have it over there on the side already. I'll give you this example, right? We talked about, okay. So if I were to scoot that guy over there to the side, just to get out of my way, okay. What is half of six? Square. So I'm gonna add nine and I'm gonna minus nine. I don't have any parentheses where I'm gonna kick somebody out, right? So you basically just factor this thing, which is X plus three and X plus three, and you combine these guys and you get positive one. And then that thing's just X plus three squared, isn't it? Which is what we said it was, right? So it's not that bad when there's no number in front, okay? But when there is a number in front, um, it's gonna, it, it, it's this, <laughs> it's a little bit more lengthy, okay? And if you didn't have this guy there, okay, then all that you would get is you would get the X plus three squared, but then that number would be down here because you weren't given an extra number to combine with it, okay? So now that I have another expression that is equivalent to the one up there, we're gonna replace it. So we're gonna go over here and we're gonna, I don't like the two there, I'm gonna put the two in the front. <laughs> so it's one over the square root of 100 minus X minus 10 squared. Yes. And so this is equivalent. Every single line we've been doing has been equivalent. 
you've just been manipulating it, right? It does. Well, it doesn't give us a square, but it gets it gets rid of the square issue that we had earlier, yes. Because when I do du now, what's the derivative of x? It's just one, and the derivative of 10 is just zero, right? So we just get du equals dx. And so I end up with this. And this should look familiar. It looks like the anti, not anti, the arc, the inverse trig function formulas. Yeah, I think it's arc sine. So if I let A equal what? U is the U, I don't have to worry about it. But A is equal to 10. Right, because it should be a squared minus u squared. So a is equal to 10. So when I apply my formula, it's going, that one does not have the fraction in front. So it's just going to be arc sine of u over my a, which was 10. And there's no bounds. So we do have to put the plus b. And then we just have to make sure that we don't leave u in there because the problem did not have u, right? So it's actually x minus 10 over 10. Let's see. Do not cancel the tens, right? That 10 is not a factor. That 10 on top is a term. You cannot cancel the terms. If it were 10x minus 10, then yeah, you could factor out the 10 and then it's factor now, right? And then you can cancel it. But right now you cannot. If you really, really does it like your brain is just like 10 over 10, I want to reduce it, then make sure you split it like that. Okay. And then it will reduce. But don't forget that X is also over 10. But this should be good. One with the what is going on to my computer? <laughs> Normally, you have like boxes, like the people in the boxes on the side. I don't know if them. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I do still have my participants, so they're still in here. Oh, yeah, they're there. Okay, cool. Yay. Okay, any questions about that one? We covered a lot in that one, right? We, we recovered all the completing the square jazz. We talked about why we have to complete the square, and then we followed through with how it works, right? Problem. Because mm -hmm. there's a couple of them in the homework that make you complete the square. There's a few. The other two actually look a lot like the ones that I did in the video. So I didn't want to do those as well because we already had one that was very similar in the video. But I definitely wanted to cover one because there were two or three people that had a question about it. Okay. So this one. Does this one require you so? That's the question. Not does it require you so. Does it require completing the square? So. What would you let u and b in this one? Yes. And then what would du be? Do it, yeah. and you got it right. So this one doesn't have any issues whatsoever. You could you could split it up. I usually do just because my brain does not compute. I usually take the two x side, and when you do that, it becomes a little bit more obvious what's getting replaced, right? So 
So that junk on the inside becomes the U, and then all of this junk on the side just magically is the U, right? Now this, unfortunately, we cannot integrate. There's no rules that apply to that, um, but we do have a power rule, right? So if I can write U as a power, then I could apply the power rule. So this would actually be U to the negative of half, half because it's a radical, right? And negative because it's downstairs. Couldn't that also be an R sign? No, we need A squared minus U squared in order for it to be R sign. Or A squared plus U squared if you want to be R tangent. But it does have to have another term plus or minus the U squared. So when we apply our power rule, oops, there will not be no more S. I saw that on that test. I don't know who was doing it. I don't know if it was an online class or a remote class. It can't be the remote because they haven't created the remotes yet. But I don't know if it was somebody in this class or somebody on the online class. But it was a notation situation where you were already applying the exponent rule, but yet you still had an S here. You can't put the S when you're already applying the integral rule. Right. If you look on your integral sheet, you have the integral and then you have what it's equal to, and there's no more s over here on this side. So make sure you don't put the s when you're applying that integration power rule. Now, this one I don't get to put plus c because we do have bounds, right? So we have to say over any evaluated from zero to four, but not u equal that's not for you, those bounds are for x, aren't they? So you'll notice in my papers, whenever I do the solutions for the test, I always, as soon as I change the variable, I keep writing like x equals this and x equals that to remind myself, go back to x before you, if you don't change the bounds. Some people change the bounds. I know there's a few people in the remote class that change the bounds. They say, oh, well, if x is zero and I square zero and I add four, then that bound will become a four. And if I square four, that's 16. And if I add four, that'll make it 20. So my bounds should be for you, four to 20. And then when they get this, they'll just plug in the 20 and put in the four and do it, okay? And that's totally okay to do. However, sometimes this gets a little more complicated and it's not as easy to just change the bounds for you. So I never do it. I don't even bother trying to think of when can I do it and when can I not do it and all that jazz. So I just leave it alone and backs up, okay? As long as you backs up, you're good. So remember, dividing by one half is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So it's actually two u to the one half. And then if I put back what u was, and the one half means a square root, it's x squared plus four, right? And now that I have my x back in there, I can just put zero to four. If you put zero to four the whole way without writing x equals, that's okay. I don't mind that. That's not going to be counted wrong or anything. The only reason why I write it for me personally is so that I have a bad habit of just wanting to, I did all that work. I just want to plug in the numbers already. <laughs> and so I have a bad habit of plugging in the numbers to you, even though I could be back up. And so that's why I usually write this to remind myself to back up. So when I square four, it's 16 plus four is going to give me 20. And when I plug in zero, zero squared to zero plus four is going to be four. I think you can simplify those. This will be two times two squared to five, and then two times two. So you end up with four squared to five minus four. You could also type two squared to 20 in your calculator, and it should just pop out four squared times. So if I do two square root of 20, get out of there. Yeah, see, you don't have to do the middle step. I did this by myself and then I have twice. And even if you do two square root of four, it'll just tell you it's four.
I've just seen square root of 12, square root of 20 like a million times in my life. So I kind of know it's already two square root of five, right? Mm -hmm. Y square root of 20 is four times five, right? You bring it up and you get two square root of five. Okay. Taking us back. Now, I think that was my last one for this section. So there are two more problems in there. And then there's a couple of problems that are just basically asking, what should you be in this, in this integral? What should you be in this integral? And that kind of thing. Just that you can identify what you should be. Now, a whole new technique Right, because this is not nothing new. It's just kind of getting a little bit more intense, and so they wanted you to see like when you can use sub, when you need to mess with it to use use sub and stuff like that. Okay, um, we'll come back to that whole idea later because there's another section. I think it's called um, something about partial fraction decomposition. Do you remember doing that in pre -cal? Yes, that was to the end of pre -cal, so it might be more. More memorable because normally you remember the stuff at the end and not the beginning. Um, but yes, we did do partial decomp and we will go over it again. There will be a little box because <laughs> it's a full process, right? Um, and we definitely will use that one too. So there will be another technique of manipulation later, but right now they kind of cut into a totally different topic, which was by parts. Remember that section? So this one was by parts. And then there was a good question, and I think it was Rebecca that asked it. Um, is it possible to use tabular method all the time? Thank you. So the tabular method is really cool once you see it work, and especially for some of the problems that require multiple applications of the by parts formula. So like you do it, and this is the by parts formula. It's U, B minus. So if you're integrating u dv, then it can the integral is uv minus the integral of b du. Okay, that's the rule. So yes, you always will have something as u, and you will always have something as dv when you're starting off. Okay, and then you're going to use that u to figure out what du is, and you're going to use that dv to figure out what v is. Okay. So you have to identify what u is and what dv is, and then you have to derive, take the derivative of u to get du, and then you have to integrate dv to get v. Okay. Um, but sometimes when you do that and you apply, you get this. Sometimes this little integral right here cannot be integrated unless you use by parts again, and so then you have to do by parts with that again. Okay. And sometimes it repeats multiple times, and I mean like four, five, six, seven times. Okay. It's a nightmare to try to do it by hand each separate one time. Okay. Because you'll basically get this term minus two more terms, minus two more terms. You know what I mean? And it just grows and grows and grows. It's a long um, termed expression. So they came up with what was called the tabular method. Okay. Now, the tabular method can be used. However, it does not work for everything. I mean, it kind of works. There will be a point at which you have to stop and you have to look at what you have and then do some more manipulation. Um, there's one famous, famous problem for, for that, and that's, I think it's the uh, integral of secant squared x. Okay, it's a whole thing. Wait, whoa. Well, I don't know. I don't think I got it in a video, but anyway, it's a thing. <laughs> we'll see it at some point. Um, but what happens is, is that if I were to integrate, let's say something like e to the two x um, cosine of x dx, they always say to let u equal the algebraic expression. So like anything that has like seven x x squared x cubed x to the fourth. Anything like that is what you usually try to let u equal. And the reason is, is because whenever you do that, let's say I had, you know, 
whatever it is, like x to the fifth power, it doesn't matter what it is, 2x to the fifth power. If I take the derivative of it, and I keep taking the derivative of it, you will eventually, right, get to zero, okay? So there's only a finite number of integrals that you'll have to take to get the final answer, okay? However, when, I forgot the word, there's a word with these words, that these things, they're called non-transcendental, okay? So this is called a transcendental function, and then these guys are like non-transcendental. And what it means is that you could keep taking the derivative of them forever and ever and ever and ever, and it will never get to zero. And what's going to happen, if you're trying to do tabular method, you can only stop once you get zero. So if they're going and going and going and going forever, tabular method is probably not the best way to go, okay? Because you have to have a stopping point, okay? That's what's interesting about this one, because what happens with this is you take the, and I'm not, I'm just doing, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, so if we take this thing, I think it's secant cubed, actually, not secant squared. So if we take secant cubed x dx, we separate it. We get secant, my brain was like, I already wrote the s, but no, it's not. <laughs> So secant and then secant squared x dx, okay? Now there's a whole trick technique on how to do this. And so normally this problem doesn't come up until we get there, but I'm just gonna kind of walk it through, just kind of take my word for what I'm doing. And then you'll see what's gonna happen in the end. Cause this is very much so they're both non-transcendental functions, right? I can take derivative, 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 just keep giving me trig functions, trig functions, trig functions, trig functions, and I can always take the derivatives of, okay? It'll never go to zero, okay? So if I were to let u equals secant x and I were to let dv equals secant squared x dx, you have to have the dx because I'm about to integrate, aren't I? Okay, so when you integrate both of these sides, the integral of dv is just b and the integral of secant squared is actually tangent of x. You don't put plus c. You only put one giant plus C at the end once you're done with all of your integration and there's no more integral symbols, okay? So if I do U B minus the integral of B du, do you know what du is? The derivative of secant X is secant X tan X, okay? So let's go see what we get. We get U secant X times B, tan x minus the integral of b tan x. So when I get dx, right? Take the derivative of something with respect to x, you have a dx. So this is b. du is secant x tan x dx, right? Now that could be Secant x times tan squared dx, right? Okay, trig function or trig identity. What is tangent squared? Something with a one. I don't ever remember them. I'm just gonna, I, I, there's hardly anything I remember. I'm just being honest with you, I hardly ever remember anything, but I know how to drive things. Okay, so if I remember one thing, I can use that to figure out what I want. So I only remember that, and this is totally lazy notation. Okay, so don't kill me here. <laughs> I'm just being lazy. Okay, so that's sine squared plus cosine squared, right? It was one. We know that one. That's normally the common one. Okay, but if I want secant, that means I'm going to have to divide by cosine, right? So if I divide all of these by cosine squared, that secant squared, sine squared over cosine squared, which is tangent squared, this is the same thing, so it's one, and then this one is secant squared. So I have the other trick identity, and I don't need to remember it at all. If you divide them all by sine squared, you'll get the other one with the cosecant and the cotangent, okay? Um, 
But I want to know what just 10 squared is, right? So you minus the one over. So this would actually be secant squared x minus one. Okay. So I don't remember them all. I just use one fact and then derive the others. Okay. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Because I cannot use tabular. If I try to use tabular, it's going to keep going around and around and around. But if I distribute this, I get secant cubed x minus secant x and then dx. I can separate these terms, secant x, tan x minus, hmm. Okay, this minus actually goes to both terms, doesn't it? So when I separate it, it's gonna be secant cubed x, dx and the negative and negative will be plus the integral of secant x dx. Here's the question. That is on the chart. So if you go look at your table, do you all have that worksheet with you? It has something to do with ln. I know that. Can I borrow that? Okay. 200 slots into this one. I think they're like all full of scratch. Don't ever think that happened. <laughs> Not walk today. Um, okay, so where is it? This one here. So this number 12 tells us the integral of secant. But notice nowhere in here does it say secant cubed or secant squared. Well, secant squared is in there because it's tangent, right? But there's no secant cubed. So I could not use this chart to figure out what the integral of secant cubed was, okay? Which is why we went ahead and started going at it with my parts, okay? But I do have one for just regular secant, and it's this weird thing, and I'm gonna write that there. Ln of secant, my u is my u, it's an x, right? Plus 10 x, and I'm not gonna put my plus c because we'll do that at the very, very, very end, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Just see me trying to come down my hair. <laughs> I, I don't know why going up is not a problem, but going down is a nightmare. Okay, what's on this left hand side? What if I start with what is it that's equivalent to this? Yeah. This thing, right? What I started with isn't that was equal to this? Okay. Now, if I were to use tabular method, I'd be going on and on and on and on and on and on and on forever. But here, do you see anything? We've got that the original formula inside. Of right, we have this that we were trying to figure out over here as part of my answer, right? So this is where the tabular method does not work and just doing it by parts works because I can add this thing to both sides of this equation. So you're saying that equals that. That's a statement. Once you have those equation statements, you can work with them. You can solve them. Then I have two of these, don't I? And so then here, I only have these two terms. And if I was trying to figure out what just the integral of secant cubed is, don't I need to get rid of that too? So then you just divide everybody by two, right? So you get that the integral equals one half times all of this stuff. And I apologize if I do it in the video later, I just zoom right over it because we already did it here. But this is the classic case where tabular does not work. Just because we have those non-transcendental functions, they don't just go to zero, okay? It's not like x or 5x plus 10 or any, you know, any of those algebraic expressions. They don't go to zero, okay? And if I were to try to do tabular, you'd be going around and around and around and around and around forever. But if you just do by parts and then use some trig identities, you get this weird algebraic situation happening. And then you can find the actual integral. Okay. So, no, tabular method does not work all the time. That was a long answer, right? <laughs> um, I'll now include that in the, in the notes. Um, 
You only want to use tabular method if you have expressions like with x. So like some coefficient maybe x and then some power. Okay. Those are when you want to use the tabular method. If you have just x without a power, you don't have to use tabular method. I mean, you could, but you don't have to. Okay. Because it's only going to have one application of the integration rule of the by parts rule, and that's it. It'll be over. Okay. But if you have an x squared, and if you watch the video, we did have a double application of the by parts formula. If you had an x cubed, it would be a triple application of the by parts formula. If you had an x to the fourth, it'd be a quadruple application of the by parts formula. Okay. And so that's when tabular method would definitely come in place. Now I think we do have, no, I don't, but I know I did one in the video where it had an x squared or an x cubed. And then we had to do it like again. Okay. For here, though, it won't require that. So if I were to let u and u, you always want to let u equal the thing that is easily derived. Okay. Now, this one's kind of weird because you have 7x, which is pretty easy to take the derivative of, and you have e to the 4x, which is also pretty easy to take the derivative of. Okay. But, and they're also easily both equally easily integrable, meaning I could take the integral of 7x pretty nicely, and I could take the integral of e to the 4x pretty nicely, okay? Uh, what's the problem here is that uh, you need to go with the easiest one, and if you can, let u equal the transcendental one, so the one that will eventually go to zero. If I do the derivatives to e to the 4x, I'm always going to get e to the 4x times some coefficient, okay? So that one's definitely not going to be the u, but I can't start yet because look at this form and then look at this. This is a fraction that is not, right? So I cannot start saying what u and dv are because this does not look like this, but you can rewrite it with a negative exponent. And then now it looks more like just one line, right? Now, I know that this guy, when I take the derivatives of it, it will eventually go to zero. So that's the one that I'm going to say, let u equal 7x. And then dv will be e to the negative 4x dx. So that when I integrate these guys, I get v equals. And here's not too bad, I just get 7 dx, right? Now there's a whole process with that integral of e to the whatever, but if you do it enough time, you start to realize the pattern, okay? Um, in the rule, it tells you that the integral of e to the u, the u is um, just e to the u, right? But what happens if that is not just the same as this, okay? you have to use the uh, u sub, right? So if I have this, I would say like u equal negative four x, and then du would be negative four dx, or dx would just be negative one fourth du. So then this becomes e to the u times negative one fourth dx. Factor out the one four. Yes, just change the variable. This will back. And then you can apply the formula. Right? And then you back up and you end up with this. But what's the pattern? When I integrate something, don't I get the same thing? But I also have to divide by the derivative of up there, which was just negative four. Okay. So I don't do all of these steps, especially not in the tabular method. I don't do all these steps every time I have to integrate e to the something x. Okay. I remember the pattern that it will be the same thing, e to the negative four x divided by the derivative of this, which is just negative four. It doesn't work if it's a square, because then 
you would need if d if you had a square d you would have an x and you don't have an x right so it becomes different but this is going to be e to the negative four x over negative four and another way to write that is negative one fourth e to the negative four So we're going to now apply the biparts. So for biparts, it's going to be u b minus the integral of b du. So 7x times b, which is negative 1 fourth e to the negative 4x, minus the integral of v again, and then du, which was 7 dx. So u b minus the integral of b again and then du. So all the pieces really go. And then we have two things. One, we need to make this look nicer. And then two, we actually need to figure out what the integral of this is. So this is going to be negative 7 over 4 x e to the negative 4x. And if you multiply those guys and you pull out the coefficients, this will be plus 7 fourths integral of e to the negative 4x dx. We've already done this integral. Didn't we just do it over there, right? So I multiply those guys together. I multiply these two together, but they're constant coefficients, right? So I just put it up to the front, and that guy there, that guy's there. And this integral we've already done, we got this expression. So this integral here will be that same expression. And now that I have no more S's, this is where you put the big fat plus E. This is not as pretty as it can be. So we multiply those two together, we'll get negative 7 over 16. And then now we have it. I'm going to do the same problem, but with the tabular method. You could do a tabular method. It's just not necessary, like if it were if that were 7x squared. So fourth one was regular by parts application. And then now over here, we're going to do it tabular. So I'm still integrating this thing. We still have to write it as one. Uh, expression without a fraction. So that part's not any different. It's the same thing. Okay. The only thing is, is that we're not going to be doing the Q, B, and then using this formula. We're going to do the by parts, which uses a chart instead of this formula. It's equivalent to it. It's just instead of. So let me go over here. And basically, you're going to have a bunch of derivatives for you and then a bunch of antiderivatives for dv, okay? And you don't use the dx, it's just not in there when you do the tabular method, okay? So when I take 7x, because that's the one that will eventually go to zero, right? What's the derivative of 7x? And then what's the derivative of seven? Zero. And then that's when you stop. So we got lucky because it was just 7x7 and 0, right? If it were an x squared, you'd have one more row, right? If it were x cubed, you'd have two more rows. 
because you have to get to a square, then an X, then a constant, and then zero. Now the DB, we're just going to put this guy and see, this is where that little, if you recognize the rules, it comes in very handy, okay? So we already know that when we integrate this, it's going to be the same thing, but divided by the derivative of this, which is just negative four, okay? Then if I pull that out to the side, I need some room. You could even start writing them as fractions. You just write one over whatever number is down there. Okay. But now when I take the integral of this, it's going to be negative one fourth times e to the negative four x over negative four. Again. So when you multiply these things together, you get e to the negative four x, and that becomes a positive 16 or just one over 16. E to the negative four x. Okay, so I don't ever write this. I usually write this one and then this one. So when you see me doing it in that tablet method, I just write those virtual Okay. So we just keep integrating. You keep integrating until you get to the zero. Once you get to the zero, you're done. You're gonna stop. So I I in I had the DP. I integrated it once to have something to go with in the line with seven, and then I integrated again to have something in line with zero. Once you're there, you stop, right? Zero is the end of the line. Everything's going to get just multiplied by zero after that point. So there's really no point in having anything else past the zero, okay? Because you always have to do u times b, right? So then, with the tabular method, is you go to the diagonal. So you never actually use this guy ever. And you don't even use them when you do this. Do DB ever in here? No, right? You never use DB. So we don't use the original DB. And then it goes at a slant. So that one goes with that one, that one goes with that one. And this one would be pointless to do another one because what's zero times anything? It's a zero. So that's why we don't need to do it anymore over there. Another thing is notice that it's positive first, right? And then it turns negative. Even after all the repeated applications, it still follows that same process, okay? So this one will be positive, negative, positive. If there were more, negative, positive, negative. It just keeps following that sign variation. And then you're just finding the products. So this times this. If I multiply these two things together, I'm going to end up with negative 7 over 4x e to the negative 4x. If I multiply these two guys together, negative seven times this, I'm gonna end up with negative seven over 16 e to the negative four x. And I'm done, I'm gonna put my plus e. That's the exact same thing we got up there. There's just a lot of party, right? So as long as your x is just x squared, x cubed, x, whatever it is, then do the tabular method B a lot faster. Peter grade two. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just it, and it's not so much right. Okay. okay. I only have one more. Yeah, we have already, right? <laughs> okay. This one, I'll leave that one right there if somebody's still writing it. Yeah, and I didn't write it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I know. Have y'all seen that Trip to Infinity episode on uh, Netflix? It's so cool. Trip to Infinity. A trip to Infinity. Infinity? Yeah, that's true. The whole show is about minute. it's like 40 minutes or an hour. It's insane though. It's like very mind-boggling. So, and when they talk about it, I'm just like, yes, yes. And they talk about all the things that they proved and disproved, and it's insane. And then it gets dark for a minute, because then this one guy just starts talking about how he used to think that nothing mattered because we're just a speck in existence and blah blah blah. 
And he's like, and then I fell in love. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, but he didn't say with what? To the math. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see this one. I have this one in here. Oh, this one was good. <laughs> This one was interesting because if you let u equal x minus 36, right? du, which is the, the one dx. The problem is, is that you had that extra x in there, okay? However, you can deal with that. You can deal with extra variables in there. What you can't deal with is when you're missing extra variables that you need. Okay. And the reason why is because I could take this and I can solve for X to know what to plug in for X. If I just add 36 on both sides, I get that X can be replaced with U plus 36. That's not a problem. So what happens is that the X by itself becomes U plus 36. What's inside the house, that becomes a U. And then the DX becomes DU. And this is not impossible to integrate. You just have to change it to a power and then distribute. So this is U to the one half. And if I distribute it, be careful, you have to add your exponents, right? So what's the invisible one plus one half? Three over two. And then that's just going to put a coefficient in the front, right? Then if I do my power rule, I don't need the S anymore. This would be five halves times two fifths. This would be 36 U to the three halves times two thirds and no bounds. So we just have plus C. And then U was X minus 36. And here I've got some computation to do. Three goes into 36, 12 times two is 24. So it's weird because we haven't seen one like that, right? We've never done that kind of U substitution where we had an extra variable in there and we kind of just use this statement to figure out what to replace that extra variable with. So again, extra variables is not too bad of a problem. It's when you're missing variable that you need for du that that becomes a problem, okay? And normally the fix for missing an extra variable is the bipart, not the bipart, it's the complete the square. But here we had an extra. What if there was an extra x squared? All you would have to do is take this expression, x squared, and then you would know what to replace the x squared with. If you took this thing and squared it, you would know what x squared would need to get replaced with. Is this anybody's ring here? There's like a big full ring. Oh, I wonder if you have a teacher who's on the phone. Oh, my God. I'll leave it here for now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I mean, that no, they said it's a giant ring. <laughs> Looks like it would be heavy. I haven't touched it though. Okay, um, that is the end of what I have for now. So as always, right, if you're working on that web assignment stuff and you get stuck on something, message me, right? Just, I always ask that you message me a picture of the problem because when you say, I'm working on 11.5 or whatever, one, I might not be around web assignment, right? I could be at the grocery store and I could still help you in that instance as long as you send me a picture 
of the problem. <laughs> um, and then I like to see what you've tried. So because normally it's a lot easier for me to just tell you, oh, you missed this one little number than it is for me to sit there and try to scribble the whole problem down and then, you know, and then to try to post that. It just gets complicated. So it's much easier if you just show me whatever you've done, even if it's not much, just show me what you've done and I can kind of steer you from there. Okay. But that's all I have for you guys. I know it was a lot. Sorry. It was, it was. Yeah, <laughs> hard to explain. But I, again, I apologize if I do this taking cute in the video. I'm pretty sure I do. It's like a super popular one. You have a great. You too. Have a good one. Yeah, the eight point one, eight point two are due Friday. Yes. Okay, if there are no questions, you guys, you guys are free to go. Um, if you do come up with questions later, just please text me and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Other than that, you guys have a good uh, weekend. Thank you. There we go.